can make sure that we get the first part as well as part of the recording. Thanks, Claire. So in terms of stigma and discrimination, if we're talking about common language, it's worth touching base on this as well. So a stigma, what we mean by stigma is a mark of shame, punishment or disgrace. Um, it's about um, negative thoughts, stereotypes and prejudice. Um, and it, a stigma is often based on a preconception, misunderstanding or fear of mental health or mental illness. Discrimination, though, is the action, I guess, is when a person creates barriers and inequalities for someone with lived experience of mental health problems. For, for example, so for example, not inviting an applicant for a job interview because um, they've disclosed a mental health problem. So what does the picture look like in terms of mental health stigma at work in Scotland? These statistics are from um, national uh, poll that we ran in 2021 right in the middle of COVID and we found out we asked people about their experiences of stigma and discrimination in the workplace but also their attitudes and perceptions uh, across a number of statements and we found that 45 percent of people had experienced at the time a mental health problem that's almost one in two we also found out that 33% of people felt their workplace supported employees who are returning to work at time after time off due to a mental health problem. That's around 67% that wouldn't feel that way, which is a huge number. 29% of respondents said or felt their organization makes clear efforts to increase staff mental health awareness. Again, that's about 70% that didn't feel that way. 26% of people said their organization encouraged staff to open um, conversations to uh, around mental health problems. Again, that's almost three quarters of people that don't feel that way. 38%, and these are the, I guess for me, they are the key statistics here. 38% of people would be unlikely to disclose a mental health problem for fear of being discriminated against by colleagues or for fear of losing their job. So there's a lot of stigma still preventing people from um, reaching out. And 99, uh, 99, 19% of people said that they had a need to take time off, but they felt unable, unable to take it. For We didn't ask the reasons, but the, the clear message is that people are still going to work when they're feeling unwell, which leads to presenteeism. I have a number of quotes here that I think illustrate very well stigma in the workplace. In terms of self stigma, internalized stigma, um, we have, I didn't ask for help when I was struggling. Everyone else was having a tough time and my manager would just say I was attention seeking again. In terms of public stigma, so those are the, the, the um, I guess, stigmas that come from how um, mental health is portrayed publicly through media or um, um, campaigns um, and, and just messaging in general. Um, due to my bipolar disorder diagnosis, I failed a workplace medical for a teaching role, despite never having an issue related to my mental health throughout my teaching career. They subsequently quoted the Glasgow Bean Lorry tragedy as their rationale, implying that my condition made me dangerous. I was certain that they felt I was unfit for work, so withdrew. I was without pay for four months as a result of this experience. And in terms of structural stigma, which is the stigma that comes from how institutions and workplaces included are set up, we have a quote that is, Application forms at work include questions about mental health problems if they happened decades ago. It feels as if you will never escape the label. In terms of direct discrimination, I've suffered with mental health issues for 25 years and until 2019 had been with my employer for 19 years and had no reason to tell them of these issues until I had to take a period of time off, the only time due to my mental health. 
Following return to work, I was marginalized and given less and less work to undertake until I was then made redundant one year following my period of time off. There was also um, um, quotes around the failure to make reasonable adjustments to support people returning to work. Like I recently had to leave my employment after nine and a half years due to my flexible working request being denied. And the consequences of these experiences, and we've seen this many times over in the staff service we run for employers, is um, the impact that other colleagues' experiences have on, I guess, has on people that are struggling and perhaps they are afraid of asking for help. So we have here a coach says, I am a supervisor in retail. My manager has been very judgmental of one of our sales assistants' mental health struggles. And as a result, I haven't told anyone about my specific diagnosis symptoms. These quotes actually reflect the experiences of a lot of people. Even if they feel that they are very specific, we find that actually they are quite common experiences. And if we talk about people that experience uh, or live with mental illness in Scotland, the I guess the picture is um, a bit more dire. We ran a, a survey, um, a study called the Scottish Mental Illness Stigma Study. Um, it was based on a survey uh, mimicking uh, another um, a program of work that was um, uh, carried out in uh, Australia and also uh, later on in Canada. So we're starting to get a picture, an international picture of a stigma associated with mental illness. And we explored experiences around um, 14 uh, live areas, including uh, workplaces and employment. And um, we looked for experiences of stigma and discrimination in the 12 months prior to running the survey. So you will see here that this was done during COVID uh, between 2021 and 22. Um, so there were limitations in terms of how many participants uh, could take part. Um, but you can see there that it was a good number for 116 people participating either through surveys or focus groups and interviews. In terms of the 14 life domains, we wanted to identify which um, domains were um, the, I guess, where people felt um, they, they experienced uh, stigma and discrimination most frequently, and also um, what domains had the biggest impact in terms of those experiences. And we identified employment actually came top um, for impact, even if the frequency was further down the list of domains. So what it means is people might not necessarily experience a, a stigma frequently, but those experiences uh, those experiences have a massive impact on their um, ability to stay and to um, be and work. And what we also found, and this was true across all domains, was there is a trend. So when people experience um, stigma, whatever the domain, what they find is they anticipate the stigma from happening or them experiencing stigmatizing attitudes and, and behaviors. And therefore that leads them to withdrawing from services, including employment. So I'm just going to share the, um, the uh, I guess, key findings from the employment domain, but I would really encourage you to go and have a look at uh, others, including relationships, which although the relationships focus more on family and friends, we know that within the workplace, there are relationships as well that people build. And we found that stigma was um, key and in terms of uh, those relationships um, and it acts as a barrier for people to feel they had strong relationships in their families and friends. So looking at employment, we found again that trend of experiencing stigma multiple times leading to anticipating stigma and withdrawing from employment. And you have here are some key statistics. 57% of people have been unfairly denied employment opportunities, which then have led to 70% of them expecting to be unfairly denied employment opportunities 
and 85% as a result have stopped themselves from applying for, for employment opportunities. Now, we know that a lot of people that are um, withdrawing from employ, employment opportunities have a lot of skills and uh, knowledge. And so that means that employers aren't tapping into that talent because there's there's no the right support or the right, um, I guess, conditions for people to talk about their mental health needs. 77% have been treated unfairly at their place of work. 74% expect to be treated unfairly. And 75% have stopped themselves from discussing their mental illness needs and experiences at work. It means that they are being unsupported and they deal with all the needs by themselves. 30% of people agreed to some extent that they had been unfairly asked to leave employment. 48% expect to be unfairly asked to leave and 45% actually said that they have resigned or left employment before they were ready. There were some people that um, shared some positive experiences um, as well. So not everything was uh, negative. Um, and those who had positive experiences had their lived experience valued in work, which is great. But unfortunately, 64% of people stopped themselves from asking for flexible work arrangements or other reasonable adjustments. Again, it means that people don't feel that they can be supported in the workplace. So um, hopefully this is helpful for you to get a picture of the, you know, what, what's the reality for people uh, living with mental illness in, in the workplace or in, in employment. So why is addressing stigma then essential to your mental health at work approach in the workplace? Um, so with stigma, as I said, is a barrier to well-being. It has impact on individuals in terms of damaging confidence and limiting their potential and also prolonging the, their illness because we know that um, employment is a protective factor for people um, and people's mental health. We know that people disengage from activities and surveys and, and they don't really want to um, interact because of this stigma because of their fear that people will find out or the people will judge them. And of course, that limits the impact of any improvement activity that is taken, uh, uh, carried out in the, in the workplace. If you think, for example, training, which is a, a very common, um, I guess, um, investment in workplaces, it doesn't matter how much you train like managers to have conversations. If a stigma is in existence, if it's still a barrier, people are not going to feel confident using those skills, open conversations, but also employees won't open up either. So it can be definitely a barrier to well-being. It can also be a barrier to self-management. So people um, seeking uh, support or help and also preventing uh, people from getting the support they need. If they don't open up, then they're not going to use the employee assistance program or occupational health or other supports like mental health first aids uh, that your workplace puts in place. Um, and it leads to low mental health disclosure rates or disclosing based on other issues like back problems or migraines, for example. It also affects retention and performance, which I guess for from a business perspective is one of the of the uh, challenges for businesses. Um, there it leads to high sickness absence, again declining to disclose, uh, high staff turnover, uh, which leads to loss of exper expertise, talent, and uh, passion uh, for the workplace um, and for your business, and also low productivity, um, again presenteeism. Um, and could impact on quality of service to clients. So people who experience mental ill health say the stigma they face is worse than the diagnosis itself, which is really sad. Um, what are the benefits of tackling stigma? Again, there's obviously a business case. Um, there are plenty of benefits to employers and employees, but also to relationships between customers and service users um, in creating a space where people feel they can be themselves at work and perform at their best with the right support. There are benefits in terms of the legal um, requirements for employers uh, in terms of is the first thing to do. 
and then also inclus inclusion, I guess, in terms of people, as I said, feeling accepted, valued and supported. People spend a long time at work um, and it's as important that people feel that they can be themselves and they can actually um, have, uh, I guess, a, a successful uh, time in the workplace, um, whatever that means for the employee and the employer. At CME, we work um, around a number of building blocks, and these are all based on uh, the evidence-based uh, research um, of um, what the, I guess, uh, evidence tells us we need to focus on if we want to tackle stigma and as part of a, a mental health um, workplace or a mentally healthy workplace, I guess. Um, and those are commitment of senior leaders and managers. If we talk about supporting conversations and creating a stigma-free environment, it needs to start from the top. Um, it needs to be signaled by leaders that actually this is important, that there's going to be a zero tolerance to stigma and discrimination in the workplace. And they need to role model that and champion um, uh, lived experience as well, wherever possible. So they normalize conversations. We also look at safe, effective and pertinent disclosure, and that is working with our organizations to look at their policies and procedures to make sure that they are inclusive of mental health and also that they are implemented. The processes to implement policies lead to very little variation. Um, communication, internal communication is key in there to make sure that everyone knows what policies and procedures there are, particularly um, to support conversations um, as they are more effective if, they, if the manager knows to what to offer and what to send post to. Um, mental health awareness and literacy, again, that's very important at all levels for people to be able to self-manage conditions and even like their stress, but also um, for managers to be able to spot some of the signs um, early on and be able to put in place support that, I guess, uh, prevents people from getting worse um, in terms of uh, work-related uh, stress and experiences. Effective approaches to training, meaning not always going for the training that other people maybe suggest and that have has worked in the workplace, but maybe given thought to what are the base and um, the needs for um, the your workplace. What do you have already? How could you enhance your training? And what's going to really make a difference? And what are the processes and approaches that um, best suit your needs? Um, mental health first aid is a great source uh, of support, but it might not be the most effective for all uh, employers for various reasons. So instead of just going as a default to mental health first aid, um, maybe there are other um, uh, avenues that people can pursue um, as well as potentially mental health first aid. Uh, confident and informed line management. Again, a real focus on supporting line managers to feel confident in having those conversations and to know what a supportive conversation looks like as well. Um, Understanding and adopting reasonable adjustments. Again, this is about making sure that people understand the conversation. That is not necessarily so much about the reasonable adjustments. It's about the conversation that leads to reasonable adjustments that are effective for the individual as well as um, the, the business. Um, so the conversation there is key to successful reasonable adjustments as well as uh, the need to review this uh, over time. And then creating a stigma free culture and ethos, which in a way, if you work across on one to six um, of these areas, you're going to um, already be putting in place a really good structure for um, people to create a stigma free culture and ethos. But I guess initiatives like uh, champions in the workplace and, you know, um, national awareness campaigns and cafes around menopause or you know like a working age those are things that create spaces for people to be able to talk about their mental health and um what what stresses them what's not uh, stressing them and just create normalize conversations and making talking about mental health the norm every day 
Um, in terms of support, we have a number of um, tools, resources and uh, approaches um, for senior leaders uh, to take a, an organisational approach. We have CME and work. We have a self-assessment for employers that can uh, be really helpful to take stock of policies, procedures and practices to see where things are working well, what are the gaps, um, and then um, have a structured approach to take in action. Um, we also have um, a portal, the Seeming Work Portal, uh, that is a digital platform that takes employers through um, a, an improvement process. Uh, it contains guidance, it's, it's self-guided, uh, but also you can request some support from CME as well and just creates that um, opportunity for employers to take a flexible and, uh, I guess, tailored approach to their needs. And for those that um, don't have uh, a lot of resources or time commitment to give to to this uh, work, but they want to make sure that they do um, that they do take uh, action. We have a version which is uh, a starter pack for people to do that without having to go through uh, an improvement uh, program. Um, we also have support for managers. Uh, we have an e-learning uh, module that is available to everyone. Uh, you will get a chance to see later on one of the dramas that we play in the module uh, as part of the learning experience. And um, people can sign up to it for free, can roll it out in the organization in various ways. If you're interested in doing that, reach out and we'll give you some um, tips in terms of what has worked for other employers. Um, and also we have developed with people with experience and employers uh, a conversational guide that includes narratives from a lived experience perspective about what supportive conversations look like as well as tips and uh, do's and don'ts in terms of um, preparing for a conversation having the conversation um, and uh, employers find those really really helpful uh, we also have a number of spotlight on resources which are more practical with advice including reasonable adjustments around mental health and then we also have, you know, um, tools and activities um, to support culture, um, a culture free from stigma, including campaigns like it, it Power of OK, which is very popular in workplaces, and also um, a Time to Talk Day, which will be coming up um, again 1st of February. Uh, so watch out because it's been, I guess, launched later this month and employers will be able to uh, download um, resource, resource and activity packs. Uh, and we also uh, have resources in terms of supporting um, workplace champions in, in the work in, at work. Um, so guidance for employers uh, to think about how they can set up their own champions networks. Um, and these are, um, I guess, they've been adapted with permission from Time to Change um, uh, as well. So they've been tested already. And we are also working uh, on um, building our Workplace Anti-Stigma Champions Network. So this is an, a network open to individuals uh, that are um, working uh, and, and they want to champion um, anti-stigma approaches, but maybe they don't have the support from their employer, or maybe they are um, mental health first aiders and they want uh, to get in inspiration or champions, inclusion champions. So anyone really that has an interest in, in taking uh, action. And that's that's about it. We also have uh, the learning uh, program events. Um, there are a couple still um, in the work. So um, keep an eye on, on the event right um, page for that. Um, and also we are working with Scottish Government and uh, Public Health Scotland um, to uh, facilitate a national network uh, for employers to share learning and to really, uh, I guess, hear about what, what's working, what's not working um, in terms of supporting a mental healthy workplace free from stigma and discrimination. And I'm going to stop now. And I'm going to welcome um, I'll stop presenting and I know that's a lot of information uh, we'll be sharing this slides as well but if people have any questions they want to ask um, yeah feel free to do that any questions can't see any hands up so 
that's okay. We can move on then to um, Denver's presentation. Denver, are you okay to, to share yeah. your slides? So right. I'll, Thank um, you very much. Perfect. So um, yeah, I just wanted to pass on to uh, our colleague, Denver Coulson, uh, Head of Campaigns at Health and Safety Executive. I'll let you introduce yourself properly, Denver, uh, if that's okay. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Um, yeah, as Pai said, I'm the Head of Campaigns, Health and Safety Executive, which means um, I'm very well placed to talk about the campaign that I'm going to take you through. Um, if you want the intricacies of health and safety law, um, I may not be the best person. Um, if you've got a question, but I'm more than happy to take anything and obviously you can always get back to you if it's about that. Um, and I will now share my slides, so hopefully you can see these. Yeah, we can. Great, thank you. So, yeah, um, there we go. So we, um, the, basically, where do we start from? So like, um, uh, Patty did, and she should probably had some more um, relevant statistics um, than myself as well, um, especially focused on Scotland. But as you can see, uh, mental health is now the number one reason for work-related illness in the UK, and it's on the rise. Um, our most recent stats showed it was 914,000 uh, workers suffered from stress, depression or anxiety. And we'll actually be releasing our stats in three weeks today, I believe, um, for the most, uh, obviously for the next year, for 22, 23 and no one is expecting them to go down. We're all expecting them to increase. I don't know, I'm not allowed to see them. They're very top secret within the organisation, um, but we will expect them to increase. Um, and part of that reason is uh, we're coming out of a pandemic. Um, part of the reason is um, obviously that there's a lot of issues in the world right now, I think um, both home and abroad, um, which can impact on people. Um, there's a cost of living crisis, and then part of the reason is also what, you know, what we're looking to do is normalise the conversation to remove that stigma that Patty was talking about. And actually, if you do that, you probably are going to increase um, numbers as well, because you're going to go through a period when people are actually are talking about it, but maybe the solutions aren't in place. But that does have a cost. And as you can see, uh, Deloitte and Mind um, did a study and they looked at that, that actually it's going to be a cost of about £56 billion a year. To employers. Um, there's 17 million working days lost um, for stress, depression and anxiety. So you can see where that cost is coming from. And we wanted to do something um, to actually address this. And I think one of the, um, the issues is with health and safety is that in mental health, it's a very complicated subject. There's a whole range of areas that we don't go into. Um, and I'll come back to that. And it's one of the reasons we took like we have partners like CME because we have a very sort of specific role, which is the actual assessing of risk um, and then acting upon that to prevent it. So what we wanted to do is create a campaign um, that would, let's say, increase the reach and drive action on how to prevent work-related stress, which would then promote, sustain and support good mental health in the workplace. And that is kind of where we are in the, um, the mental health um, sort of ecosphere. And that's what we want to do. So what we set off with is um, working on insights. We worked with a number of different partners, worked with our insight team. And, and what clearly came back was um, in the workplace, risk from work-related stress are not treated the, same, treated the same way as physical risks are. Um, and, and there's a clear um, sort of delineation as you, if you look at that. Um, safety's become really good. I think, you know, really over the last you know, 10, 20, 30 years, um, the safety standards in the workplace have improved massively. When you get to health, so you think talking about things like occupational lung disease, um, uh, musculoskeletal disorders, it's not quite as good there. We're not as, you know, we haven't improved as much as we have on the safety risks. When you get to stress, which is part of that ill health, um, we're certainly not there. And when it comes to mental health, and especially those impact, you know, it's just, not treated in the same way. And there's a good reason for that, not a good reason, but a clear reason why that is happening. Um, employers are not aware of their legal duties, especially small businesses. They don't know um, that they have to do it. They don't know they have to assess the risk. They don't know they have to um, then take action to prevent work-related stress and how it impacts on mental health. Um, they don't often know that link between stress and mental health. They see them as two separate things. Um, they don't know how to do it. Um, they're scared of actually um, 
often having those conversations uh, because of unintended consequences. Um, when they've looked at some things, if you ha people have looked into it, there's things like the stress management standards, they find them too complicated. And when we looked at small businesses, uh, just two thirds of them didn't even know about the legal duty. Um, yet that said, we know from you know, previous insight that two thirds of businesses generally do what they have to in health and safety law because there is a legal duty. Uh, so there's a kind of, if we can raise awareness, we, we often see people actually then taking action. Um, and during the COVID pandemic, we ran a thing called spot checks. So this was rather than inspectors going out, um, it was actually people calling businesses and actually talking about the measures they had in place. And it was for the pandemic, but we managed to get stress in there in the question set. And that backed up everything I'm saying. Again, they found two thirds of businesses weren't aware but when we actually made them aware, when we actually explained some things they could do, a lot of them then subsequently took action to improve. And, you know, why don't they do it really well? There's a lack of time, uh, there's a, the cost, a lack of training expertise. So we wanted to do something that could actually um, address these sort of problems in the workplace. And our messages were, you know, as you can see, we want to raise awareness of the legal duty. We know that raise awareness, then the subsequently things will happen. Um, as Pat said, there's a huge range of business precedent that fit. And we want to raise awareness of those. And, you know, it's not just a legal duty and it's not just a moral duty why you should do this. There's actually, you know, a good reason for a business to do it for their own benefit. Um, we wanted to help businesses understand what is actually required of them, what, you know, should they do and what shouldn't they do. And we wanted them to understand the best ways they can actually enact it in their business. And finally, we want to make it you know, as simple as managing safety, something that you do every single day. So how do we do this? How do we achieve a culture, a culture change? Well, we realised that we can do it on our own. Um, we have to build a network of partnerships and support. Um, HSC, as a you know, health and safety regulator, we have a specific role in ensuring that employers are aware of the legal duties. Um, but um, we know there's more than that. There's more than just the legal duties. So there's a whole sort of range of after that, even if you do that right, there can still be problems of stress. There can be still be problems of mental health because we're just focused on the work related element. But you can't really separate everything between work and personal life. And we, we accepted that. So what we did, we brought in a number of partners, um, all of whom had an interest and role in promoting good mental health. Um, this included people like ACAS, Mind, we had industry specific bodies like Seeker and Composites UK. We brought in relevant charities um, such as Mate and Mind and Construction um, and Yellow Wellies and Agriculture. So we're looking at the areas where we regulate and you know, where we could have the biggest impact. And these partners were fundamental to our success. At the beginning, they actually helped us with the insight, they helped us shape the campaign, um, they brought you know what exists out there and you know what's missing. And what they did, they actually we had a series of workshops where they came along on that journey and they helped us create working minds. And a key part of what they did, as well as shaping that, is they provide the support that we don't. You know, we're very much about prevention, but that's not the only support available. Um, and as I mean, Patty is a perfect example of that. You know, Simi is one of our more recent partners to join us. And you can see she's to talk through the range of resources that are actually out there. And we weren't trying to re reinvent the wheel and it's not our remit to do that. So the way we do it is bringing the, all these different partners and hopefully together, you know, we provide that support to employers. We help them on the prevention side, but if things are in the workplace that need addressing, you know, there's plenty of support available. So like I say, together we created um, Working Minds campaign and this launched uh, nearly two years ago, it'll be our birthday in a couple of weeks, 16th of November, 2021. And originally we focused on five sectors, um, agriculture, construction, manufacturing, um, the motor trade uh, and health. And we had eight partners um, as we shaped it. And we've expanded that as we've gone on, we've gone into more sectors, we've gone in, we've brought on more partners. But what Working Minds focused on was really um, simplifying the information, what we provided out there. And as, we, as I talked about the insight earlier, the stress management standards, I think, is a 59 page document. You know, businesses weren't using it. They just looked at it and it just wasn't fit for purpose. So what we wanted to do is sort of boil that down and simplify the language, simplify the steps, keep the information really 
you know what, what needs to be done is you know isn't going to really change but actually make it easier to consume and just easier for businesses to use so we came up with these five r's as you can see which is reach out recognize respond reflect make it routine and that is the stress management standards in a, in a nutshell really it's just a lot easier to say and what we did therefore is as you can see reach out um we help people make that first conversation. We provide prompts and what to say, and I'm going to come to some tools in a bit and you actually talk about those. But it's all about sort of, you know, removing that sort of worry about how you're going to do it um, and actually give you a framework to approach it in businesses. Um, if people are going to reach out, obviously, it's essentially they recognise the signs of stress. Um, and actually, some of the signs are why you would reach out in the first place. So if you notice things like increased um, uh, absence, absenteeism, people being late to work, um, you know, mood swings, you know, they're good indicators for why actually you should reach out. You should be doing it regular anyway, um, but sometimes you know, there's a specific reason to do it at that point. And obviously, if there's an issue, there's a need to respond. And um, people should sit down together, employers and employees, and they should do this together to agree on the way forward. So it actually works for both parties. And one of the key messages, actually, what we try and get out there is that employees have a legal duty to protect employees from stress at work. But diagnosing and treating stress isn't their responsibility. And that's one of the things, you know, a lot of people are worried about it because what happens if I find that? Well, actually, you know, signposting comes in there. If someone's experiencing stress or a mental health problem, they should be encouraged to talk to someone else. Now, that could be a manager, it could be a colleague, it could be a GP, it could be a union representative, it could be an occupational health team. It depends on the size and state of the business. Um, or it could be a charity. Again, that's why we bring the partners in. And if you've actually decided that it does require a response, so obviously we need to reflect on that. You know, did it work? We have to monitor and evaluate. Um, if not, you know, what do we do? What's the next approach? You know, and how can we actually do put new steps in the place? And finally, um, make it routine. It, like I say, it's not a one-off process. It should be a regular part of life at work. Um, we should normalise the conversations, and it should be, you know something that goes on and that can be just asking people is it okay and you know I've talked about you know a whole campaign just about that saying you know talk people actually have those tiny small conversations then you may not need the bigger conversations um but also in part you also got recognized that in that make it routines not everything is routine at work so there are often points to where you should recognize that you should intervene so big changes at work you know, where actually people might be worried that might lead to stress and again we put the tools in place to recognize what those are and yeah the five hours like i say management standards in a nutshell and they've basically provided the backbone of the working minds campaign for you know the last two years and how the campaign really works let's say is if you um go to our website which i'll you know, provide a link to it as well we have a huge amount of these resources so we have a page purely for employers. It sets out what the legal duty is. It sets out the law. Um, it also talks about mental health law, which is slightly different to what we look at, but what you need to be aware of, um, because you know, work-related stress is one of the, one thing, but also goes into sort of disability law as well. Um, we have the resources for workers. Um, we have a, become a champion. So one of the things I'll ask you to do is actually to join the campaign, you know, and help us support that. We have um, a series of different resources which I'll come on to, like poster, um, we have a podcast, we have our industry sectors. So again, um, where we've got specific partners and um, we've got whole pages for them to take people and to the you know the bespoke resources that they can use. Um, we have our quiz, um, you know, to assess people's knowledge and you know, sort of raise awareness. And we also have an SME app um, and we feature on that and it's got some good stress pages on there. And if you go to the website, all these are available. And when I talked about two of these things, one is the poster, very simple, um, you know, talks about the five R's, gives you a nutshell, and then it has a nice QR code and link to take people to the website. So people can put that up in, um, especially in larger firms, you can put it on the notice board and it allows all managers to actually access, or workers to access those resources. And then we also do, you know, little products throughout the year. So in April, it was Stress Awareness Month, and we created a simple one page guide that people could share across their networks, had the, all the links from um, our, you know, our own sort of topics, our own resources, but also brought together a few of the um, more national 
style was also. So we had ACAST, we had Heavy Mind Matters from the NHS, etc. And just links to those to the pages. Uh, and these were phenomenally popular. I think we, the Working Minds poster we launched at our birthday last year, and we've had 22,000 downloads um, since then. Um, our stress awareness product obviously launched in April this year, that's had more than 24,000 downloads. So you know, there's a great demand for these simple guides for people to use in the workplace. But if you really want to implement Working Minds, because it, it's a little bit more information, is it? It's how do you do it? You want the practical guides for doing that. So if you go to the website again, two of the other resources were there. It's the Talking Toolkit. Um, you know, it's a great thing, a resource it literally sets out a whole series of conversations, step-by-step -step guide, how to work through a conversation, a few prompts, things to ask, um, what you should and what you shouldn't do, and, and then how to respond to those. And you know that predated the Working Minds campaign, but it's a, what a lot of the information in the campaign is based on. And I certainly recommend people having a look at that if you want to take that and start these conversations. Um, and then also we have an example risk assessment. So you know that's one of the, the bedrocks of the health and safety executive is at risk assessment. But what we know is that a lot of people just don't include stress in them. So we've got a few different examples of three different types of uh, business, different sizes, and um, some of the things you should look out for and how you should fill that in. So again, it just gives people that prompt to take this forward. And then, um, you know, finally, we've got obviously the Working Minds website. So you saw a little picture of that before. Um, there's URL. It's on the slides that we're going to share around um, after today. It's got all the things on there that I've just talked about. Um, and then finally, you know, my ask is always uh, for people to sign up to be a Working Minds champion. Um, Champions can be, you know, in two ways. It could be because you've got an interest in the subject and you just want to improve your knowledge. Um, it could be because you want to you know, actually implement it in your workplace. It could be that you just want, you know, share it across your network. All those things are great. You know, we just want to raise awareness. Um, we want to get that information out there and we want people to join us. But today I've got an actual another reason really why I want you to sign up, because um, exactly in one week's time, it is the Health and Work Conference. Um, and at that conference, we will be launching a whole new product um, for Working Minds, specifically for um, small businesses. We've designed it. But when I say that, the whole campaign was for small business, but we've had a huge amount of positive um, feedback from larger businesses because they say actually the same business what maybe an employer has, if he has you know eight people in a business, actually a manager has if they manage eight people. So the principles of that simple knowledge um, hold true. So we really look to how we can bring, you know, working minds and the five hours to life, how we can actually upskill people. Um, so we've got, yeah, brand new product launching a week today. If you sign up to be a working minds champion, you will definitely get an alert um, and you'll get the links to actually to sign up to that. So I would, you know, encourage you to get on that straight away. And that is it for me. Thank you very much. Um, I will take any questions. Um, over to you, Patty. Thanks, Amber. That was great, very informative and actually really thorough. So um, thank you very much. Uh, great resources in there. I've used some of them personally um, and I found them really, really helpful. So thank you. Any questions for Denver? Or reflections? Oh, I see a hand. Uh, let's see. Oh, Katie. Hi there, sorry, I'm just trying to get my camera on. Yeah, thanks so much for that, um, Denver. I, I don't know if it's more of a question, but I suppose just to kind of clarify something for me, because um, this is something that I've just started working on in, in my kind of area, and it's around risk assessment and just clarifying the, the differences in risk assessment, because there's, there's a risk assessment on the individual basis if somebody is experiencing work-related stress. But the risk assessment on the kind of preventative side of things as well so that organizational level risk assessment and what that can look like and um, because i know that kind of sits under that legal requirement doesn't it but i think there's a bit of confusion as to you know whether that's a questionnaire whether it's a, a management and organizational level kind of risk assessment and um, so just a bit more clarification on that would be really helpful yeah i think obviously it is a little bit confusing because they, they kind of both exist and they both go together um when you look at the sort of stress management standards, it generally talks about an organisational risk assessment, um, and then doing it at a, you know at a, at a higher level. Um, 
I think the fundamentals hold true for both. You know, it's just obviously an individual stress assessment is very much for, like you say, is, is an individual and it, and it depends on the workplace. But the, I would say that the key benefit we always say is an organisational um, risk assessment is that it doesn't just work for an individual. You know, that's the that's what should be done. And unless you want to literally do it for every employee, um, it's the only way you can actually really you know, meet the legal duty for that. Um, because you obviously you, you've got to look at it at a, at a corporate level, so you've got to look at the different areas of the business, and you know, and, and assess the risks for those and the, and the hazards that people um, might you know, obviously approach. In a smaller business, obviously, you could probably do it for an individual, and if the roles were vastly different, you, know, you, you can obviously look at um, you know, at that level. And when we talk about reaching out, you sort of start doing it at that point. But really, you know, we would say. Um, if you're looking for the legal duty, it is generally done at that organisational um, sort of, you know, sort of top level, really. Um, I don't know if really that answers your question. Like I say, I'm not the health and safety expert, but I would say that's, um, that is generally the way we would talk about it. It does. Thank you. So is that, is that the kind of risk assessment template that you have on the website yes. as well? Yeah. Yeah. And as you, if you look at them, they will, um, you know, you'll actually see that. Yeah, there's three different ones actually on our website and they are for very small business and for larger businesses so you will see actually how they are different um, between the sort of the, you know, the two areas. Great, thank you. Thanks Katie. We will be um, doing something around that later in one of the, um, the activities so hopefully that will um, cement I guess or crystallise what Denver just shared. Um, thank you very much, Denver, for that. Um, any other questions for Denver or reflections? We have a couple of minutes uh, before we move to the break. So if anyone wants to share any reflections or ask questions, you can see on their hand, Callum. Hi, yeah, thanks very much for that, Denver. That was superb. Uh, just a quick question regarding the conference whereabouts, uh, is that? And how do you get to it? Is it? <laughs> it's a virtual <laughs> conference. Um, do you know what? I will... I will share a link. Um, I would have said if you'd asked me yesterday the um, that you can't sign up because it's um, it's already full. Um, but I believe, uh, and I'm just going to search now um, that they may have extended the numbers. Um, so let me just get this link here. If you can't sign up, don't blame me. Um, that is because it is full. Um, but it is, yeah, there you go. I've just dropped it in the chat. Grant, thank you. And uh, I've just dropped uh, the HSC um, Stress and Mental Health at Work link as well into the chat as well, right. if that's thank helpful you. for everybody. Um, on the conference call, it's not just about obviously uh, stress. Uh, we'll find out it does cover a range of ill health. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. This is peer peer support uh, at its best. Thanks, Callum, for doing that. Um, uh, I was uh, going to say something about the conference. I forgot what it was. Um, but yeah, um, we'll make sure that. Um, uh, oh yeah, I was going to ask Denver. Do you know if the conference will be recorded? Because uh, if if yeah, it should can... well, yes, okay. it will be definitely. Because I know last year's is um, you can find last year's actually on our website. Um, on the work right website, just put the link in for Working Minds. But um, if you just search on that website for conference, um, you'll get all last year's actual videos. And someone asked me yesterday, can we do it the same again? So, yes, it will. Be. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. At least if we if we can't get into the conference, we'll we'll see what what was discussed and the learnings. That's great. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think if we can do with a ten minute break. I think I don't know about yeah. you, but I can see some knots. So, um, if people can come back. Oh, Callum, do you want to come in? No, you're just supporting that. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> OK, perfect. Um, if people can come back for 11 o'clock, that would be much appreciated. And we'll stop the, the recording now. Uh, we'll see you at 11. Thank you. <laughs>